Unit 13. Exercise 1. When we bemoan the lack of originality in the world, we blame it on the absence of creativity. If only people could generate more novel ideas, we'd all be better off. But in reality, the biggest barrier to originality is not idea generation, it's idea selection. In one analysis, when over 200 people dreamed up more than a thousand ideas for new ventures and products, 87% were completely unique. Our companies, communities, and countries don't necessarily suffer from a shortage of novel ideas. They're constrained by a shortage of people who excel at choosing the right novel ideas. The Segway, a two-wheeled, self-balancing personal transporter, was a false positive. It was forecast as a hit, but turned out to be a miss. Seinfeld, an American sitcom television series, was a false negative. It was expected to fail, but ultimately flourished. Exercise 2 A striking experiment was performed accidentally by Japanese anthropologists attempting to relieve an overpopulation and hunger problem in a community of monkeys on an island in South Japan. The anthropologists threw grains of wheat on a sandy beach. Now, it is very difficult to separate wheat grains one by one from sand grains. Such an effort might even expend more energy than eating the collected wheat would provide. But one brilliant monkey, Emo, perhaps by accident or out of peak, threw handfuls of the mixture into the water. Wheat floats, sand sinks, a fact that Emo clearly noted. Through the sifting process, she was able to eat well. While older monkeys, set in their ways, ignored her, the younger monkeys appeared to grasp the importance of her discovery and imitated it. In the next generation, the practice was more widespread. Today, all monkeys on the island are competent at water sifting, an example of a cultural tradition among the monkeys. Exercise 3 the fact that a majority of the global population has at least some level of multilingual competence surely indicates that adding a second language is not a particularly remarkable feat. And yet, especially within powerful linguistic groups, it is common to find references to the difficulties involved or to the peculiar lack of language talents supposedly possessed. In the modern world, for example, English and American monolinguals often complain that they have no aptitude for foreign language learning. This is usually accompanied by expressions of envy for those multilingual Europeans, and sometimes, more subtly, by a linguistic smugness reflecting a deeply held conviction that, after all, those clever others who don't already know English will have to accommodate in a world made increasingly safe for Anglophones. All such attitudes, of course, reveal more about social dominance and convention than they do about aptitude. Exercise 4 A gentleman came into my stress management office and said, I'm mad at my boss. I don't like my job. I don't like the people that work with me. No one appreciates my work. I'm really angry. When I began teaching him about how his own thinking creates his angry feelings, he said, With all due respect, Dr. Carlson, I'm angry almost all the time, but I almost never think angry thoughts. Do you see where he was being fooled? Until that moment, he believed that thinking meant the same thing as pondering. Even though he may not have dwelled on his misery for hours at a time, he was nevertheless continually thinking negatively, a moment here and a moment there.
He spent nearly all of his time thinking about the little things that irritated and annoyed him. It was almost as if the unstated goal of his life was to analyze it and to give his opinions on how various things affected him. His negative thoughts were creating his negative feelings and emotions, and he didn't even know he was thinking them. He was a victim of his own thinking. Exercise 5. Caregivers for the old do much more than simply perform tasks. They provide intellectual engagement, social interaction, and emotional support, key factors in long term health and longevity. As society has grown more urban and as family homes have become less multi generational, greater numbers of the elderly now live alone. This shift brings with it diminished opportunities for social interaction. In the United States, a 2010 American Association of Retired Persons study found that over a third of respondents age 45 and older were lonely, as measured on the UCLA Loneliness Scale. Interactions with robots offer an opportunity to counteract, if not entirely remedy, the effects of such social isolation. Brain scan studies using fMRI have shown people have a measurable emotional response to robots, similar to that measured when interacting with other people, at least in certain situations. While robots and technology can't entirely fill our need for social interaction, they may be able to provide some level of engagement. Exercise 6 How are films made and produced? A news item, an event, a novel, or the biography of an important person might suggest suitable themes. The film director's first job is to write a short account of the subject and to present it for a producer. This simple, untechnical plan is called a treatment. Movie director Jean Renoir and his scriptwriter wrote several unused treatments for La Grande Illusion. One of them is easy to get hold of. It is quite different from the final film. If a producer and a group of actors are interested in the scheme, the director or the scriptwriter rewrites the text in order to give a full list of shots described in their order with stage directions and technical terms clearly marked. This is the scenario. There is a good scenario of October, ten days that shook the world. Written by Eisenstein himself, but once again, it is far removed from the three finished versions of the film we can see today. It is difficult to put into practice what was decided beforehand, and important alterations occur in the course of production. Exercise 7. Our present day thinking is based on a succession of historically evolved mentalities. On mental edifices which previous generations have constructed, pulled down, renovated, and extended. Past events are compressed in images and metaphors which determine our present thinking, even if we are not always aware of them. Common sense is the thickly viscous form of the past. The reflex of history, which, like the story about a puppet and a chess playing machine, always triumphs. The puppet, dressed in Turkish garb, was sitting in front of a chessboard on a large table. A cunning arrangement of mirrors created the impression of being able to see underneath the table. In actual fact, there was a dwarf sitting underneath, who was a chess master and controlled the puppet. We can imagine the continuous effect of historical experience acting like an ugly, unloved, and happily forgotten dwarf moving the pieces in the chess game of our everyday life. Exercise 8. 
Exercise 8. The word entertainment derives from the Latin tenere, which means to hold or keep steady, busy, or amused. The notion of making money by keeping an audience steady, busy, or amused remains central to those in the business of entertainment. Media practitioners then define entertainment as material that grabs the audience's attention and leaves agreeable feelings, as opposed to challenging their views of themselves and the world. However, this doesn't mean that people who work in the entertainment business always stay away from informing or persuading. Many movies that are categorized under entertainment by their production firms have been written and produced with the intention of making a political point. Think of The Day After Tomorrow, Syriana, or Blood Diamond, or an educational point like Schindler's List, Crash, or Letters from Iwo Jima. When media practitioners label a product as entertainment, though, they are signaling to their audiences that their primary concern should be with enjoyment, not with any other messages that may be included. Exercise 9 Ritual is a set of catalytic messages. Affecting transformation of state from one season of the year or one stage of the life cycle to another. State refers either to a social and biological stage in life, adolescence or adulthood, for example, or to social status, such as graduate student or doctor of philosophy. Many vertebrate species, especially birds, but fish and mammals too, have ritual. In these animals, ritual is triggered by certain messages or symbols in response to chemical messages from the genes. For example, among the three spined strickleback fish, the male's zigzag courtship dance, whereby he entices a prospective mate to his nest, is triggered by the sight of her red belly, which is the signal that she is biologically ready to lay eggs. We assume further that the form of the zigzag dance itself is genetically programmed in the male's nervous system. In any case, the ritual affects his transformation into a parent that tends the eggs in his nest. Exercise 10 Post traumatic stress syndrome. Became common knowledge, but not the concept of post traumatic growth, which is actually far more widespread. Most people who undergo trauma ultimately feel that the experience has made them stronger, wiser, more mature, more tolerant and understanding, or in some other way, better people. The influential psychologist Martin Seligman has often lamented that so much attention is lavished on post traumatic stress syndrome rather than post traumatic growth because it causes people to mistakenly expect that bad events will have mainly negative effects. After being exposed to a terrifying event, at least 80% of people do not experience post traumatic stress syndrome. Even though a single bad event is more powerful than a good event, over time people respond in so many constructive ways that they typically emerge more capable than ever of confronting life's challenges. Bad can make us stronger in the end. Exercise 11. There is a common misconception that the reason we have hunger is because the earth is straining to feed an ever growing population. This is not the case. The world uses only about a third of its arable land for crop production, and even that third we use inefficiently. China, for instance, has dramatically higher crop yields per acre than the United States. Primarily because, even though the two countries are comparable in size, 
China has three times the population of the United States and only one sixth the arable land, so its population has to grow crops more efficiently. Planet Earth is, in fact, such a prodigious producer of food that in the United States, enough food is thrown away to keep all of the hungry people in the world fed. Exercise 12. There is a saying made famous by the Nobel Memorial Prize winning economist Milton Friedman that there is no such thing as a free lunch. That we can't magic wealth out of nothing, say, by printing money, or shift costs into the ether. Friedman's view was that if we legislate to reduce a burden on some citizens or to increase the advantages they may enjoy, there will be repercussions somewhere down the line that will involve a cost for others and might even ultimately mean the measure is counterproductive. So, even if a meal is priced at zero, someone somewhere is paying for it. Modern economics may disparage the concept of free lunches, yet today one often gets a sense from key economists and policymakers that a free lunch isn't that far away. Economics claims to show how we can generate growth by identifying more efficient ways of organizing society, thereby making us richer and hopefully happier with the least amount of sacrifice on our part. Such a utopia is achievable, economists believe, because they understand the mechanisms that drive everything from business investment and production decisions. To consumer purchase choices, to individual attitudes to saving.